As pilots, some of us have heard the apocryphal story of a pilot flying, falling asleep in his plane and waking up in a field. Well, is it myth? We're going to find out in The Hangar. I'm Dan Milliken. And I'm Christy Wong. Welcome to In the Hangar. This episode is brought to you by Wingfield Aviation. Service and transparency that you can trust is centrally located in North Texas. Come from either side of the coast for your aircraft maintenance. Dan Bass, thank you for coming onto the show to talk to us. Dan, okay, I've been joking about falling asleep, but um, it's actually not a joke. I mean, it's a very serious thing. But uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your background, then we'll go into your story. Okay, well, I'm a CFI. Um, I started flying well before um, my my dad had airplanes, and I started flying at two months old. Got my private on my 16th, or got sold 16th birthday, got the private on the 17th birthday. Um, And then I was going to go the airline route, and was a typical, you know, high school screw off kind of kid. And I ended up uh, taking over my dad's business. Um, and so I've been. And what was that business? Yeah. It's a com- custom manufacturing business. Okay. So not aviation. Not aviation. Okay. Um, and I've owned a couple airplanes. Uh, currently have two airplanes. And uh, would use my airplane for business sometimes. Um, yeah, that's that's the back. All right. Now um, I let off the show with the apocryphal story, the myth of uh, the guy falling asleep. Um, I've heard the story, and I was like, I've heard the story no of way. a guy doing There's it. No way. And uh, when uh, uh, Brian Turner reached out to mm-hmm. us and had told us, that, I was like, I really thought it was a, a legend. I thought it was a myth. I thought he was pulling a prank on us. Yeah, well, that's Brian. But yeah, yeah. Um, what is the? W- I'm a bit of a legend. You are. You are <laughs> a legend. Yeah. Um, Okay, so it is not that you fell asleep. T- take us to your emergency story. Okay, well, unfortunately, yeah, it, it wasn't, I wasn't asleep. I was unconscious um, due to carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay. Um, to get to that point was, was kind of an interesting story and a lot of learning points along the way. Um, it started, it was in Minnesota, early February, and it was very cold. And so I, uh, I had to make a trip for business up to Thunder Bay, Canada. Um, I took off early in the morning. And during climb out, um, I had something get in my eye. And it felt like, um, you know, like a piece of dust or something. But, and while I was trying to get it out, I was thinking, oh, I wonder if that's carbon monoxide poisoning. And really? so, I, well, that's what I, it, it occurred to me. I never heard that. I never had either. But that's what I thought. Oh. Okay. I thought about. And so I uh, turned the, the vent on, turned my heat off and got cold really quick. Uh, it was about minus 10 Fahrenheit at altitude at that time. What kind of airplane were you in? That was a Mooney. Okay, uh, a, a Mooney. A C model Mooney. Okay. Um, and I was on an IFR flight plan. It was a beautiful day, um, high pressure system, but I went IFR because I figured uh, flying out of the country would just, it'd be a lot easier handling uh, EAPIS and customs and if I was on a You IFR were going up to plan. Canada? Yep. Okay. And this was my first time going to Canada. Um, so I kind of prepped the week before making all the plans and making sure customs was notified and I got my EAPIS the night before and, and uh, was pretty confident it was going to work out the way I expected. So in the climb I realized that, that my eye wasn't a prop, wasn't part of carbon monoxide poisoning. So I uh, turned the heat back on and my eye felt better anyway because I rubbed whatever it was out and that was the last time I thought about carbon monoxide. Um, up at altitude, I was at 10 or 11,000 feet, depending on the leg. I checked my pulse ox with my pulse oximeter, and I noticed, I, all I remember was that it was a little bit higher than it normally is at that altitude. And I thought to myself, well, that's a good sign. I'm doing good today. And it was a- Yay, oxygen. Yeah, and, and it was, I wasn't on oxygen. I was just up at, you know, breathing normally. Um, so I thought everything was going great. Um, about 10 minutes out of Thunder Bay, so I was about two hours and, uh, see, two hours and 15 minutes into the flight, I started to get a real slight headache. Um, I didn't think anything of it because I'm a big coffee drinker. Mm. And that morning, to, to make sure I leave on time, you skipped I skipped it. it. Yeah. And so I assumed I was getting caffeine a headache. Yeah, caffeine headache, mm-hmm. and it was really common. It was real light. It wasn't a big deal. Um, I landed in Thunder Bay, and the instructions I got from Customs the day before was to, before I exit the airplane, to call them on my phone. Um, and they will either say they're going to come meet me or they were going to give me a, a number, a clearance number of some sort. 
And uh, so I called them and told them I landed at Thunder Bay just, just right now. And uh, they, they sounded a little bit confused and said, what do you mean, you just now? And I said, yeah, just, just right now at 9, I don't remember what time it was, 9.15 in the morning. And he was sort of confused and then he, he said, he gave me a number to write down. And I assumed everything was fine. So I secured the airplane and I sprinted into the FBO building because it was so barely cold out. And I got into the FBO building and the, I noticed, um, and the line guy informed me of what time it was, and it was really 10.15 because I didn't realize Thunder Bay was on Eastern time. I mean, even though it was west of my position when I departed, uh, it was an Eastern time zone. Huh. Um, and so at this time, the headache is still there and I had this feeling of, of anxiety. And or it, felt, I, it, it felt like a butterfly feeling mm -hmm. and uh, I attributed it to anxiety over the customs debacle. And I, I literally at the time thought maybe they were gonna come running in with lights going and I was gonna be in trouble. Um, but here was two uh, symptoms that I was able to explain away. So one based on anxiety, one based on lack of caffeine. Huh. And then during my day at Thunder Bay, uh, I made sure to get caffeine at lunch, had a couple of cups of coffee and my headache was gone and I felt, felt good. Um, then on the return flight, I had to fly to Duluth, Minnesota to clear customs back in. Um, and that flight, I felt great. It was a beautiful flight. The sun was going down. I was later than I hoped. I was hoping to be back home before dark, but because I was an hour late and my meetings kind of were messed up too, so I was a little bit later of a start to head back. But the sun was going down. It was just gorgeous. And I landed in Duluth and taxied up to the ramp, and the customs agent was walking out to meet me. And when I opened the door and stood up on the wing, I got a, a splitting headache, it just, just on an instant in my head. Head was real, headache real strong. Um, and this one I couldn't explain, and I didn't associate it with the airplane so much because I felt great on the flight, mm -hmm. and now I'm out in the fresh air and I have this headache. But my uh, oldest daughter was four at the time, and uh, the preceding week she had been sick, but we didn't, so four-year-olds can't explain why they're sick. And so I just assumed, oh, I'm but, getting what she has, yeah. yeah. And then the headache was pretty strong, and we, we, we did the customs paperwork, we ran inside and finished that up. I used the restroom, I called my wife, said I'm gonna be home in just over an hour. And uh, she asked if she wanted me to save dinner, and I said, no, don't worry about it, I'll be fine. And uh, ran back to the plane, and meanwhile, my headache is pretty strong, and I, and I was thinking to myself, um, I just want to get home and be sick there, right? Get and it was, yeah, a bit yeah. of getheritis. And everything kind of stacked up. The FBO is, the line crew is gone. So if I did stay, my airplane would be outside in the cold. I'd have to go get a hotel. You know, all that stuff crossed right. my mind, what a hassle to be. But I didn't, didn't realize that my symptoms were going to get worse or anything was going to change. Um, so I ran back into the plane, I got it started. I didn't want it to get cold soaked, so I couldn't start it, so I didn't let it sit very long. And at this point, I hadn't filed a flight plan or anything, so I just started the engine, made sure it was running, got the heat on, and then as it was idling, I tidied up the cockpit. Well, first I filed my flight plan with my iPad. And you know, I was waiting for that email notice that said it was in, accepted in the system before I'd called to get my clearance. So as I was waiting for that, I tidied up the cockpit. I thought I was really prepared. I had a flashlight on the seat next to me. I had my hat and gloves on the seat next to me. My big winter coat I took off, put in the back seat. I had my sweatshirt on. Um, I wear a headlamp when I fly at night. Um, I had an electrical failure once in the past at night and that taught me that, how, the importance of that. So I had a headlamp on and I had everything kind of squared away and I was ready. And once I saw it was in the system, I called and got my clearance. Um, and then I got my taxi clearance to taxi out. 49 Victor, exit out the Monaco ramp by the east end, taxi 27 VL, Alpha, Alpha 5, cross runway 3. All right, well, exit the ramp on the east end and Alpha and cross runway 3. Mooney 49 Victor, verify Sierra. That's correct, we have Sierra. And on the taxi out, so I had this headache, and then I got a period of this butterfly feeling again. And it was really short and brief, it maybe only lasted like 10 seconds. And it went away, and I was thinking to myself, what was that? I couldn't figure it out, like what was going on? And I got to the run-up area, and my headache and the butterfly feeling were gone. I thought I felt normal. Um, so I started my run-up, and I, do a, I usually do a flow, and then I check it with a checklist. And I did my flow and then I got the checklist and I went through it and then I went through it again and I went through it again and I was sort of locked in this loop where I was, I, I just was unsure to make a decision and to move on. 
And I was in the run-up area long enough that the tower had actually called me and said, are you ready to take off? Moody, uh, four or nine or fifty, you ready to go? You need a few more minutes yet. Yeah, we're just about ready to go. And I sort of responded with, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I guess I will be <laughs> you know, in a minute. Oh, wow. And then I didn't respond after that. I was still doing a checklist. And the tower, about a minute later, just cleared me for takeoff. Mooney, 4 9 Victor, turn left heading 240, runway 27, clear for takeoff. All right, left uh, 240, clear for takeoff. One. Victor, we're, uh, we're going to go now. And when I listen to those, I can tell from me getting my clearance that I was impaired. But in the moment, I had no, no idea. Um, so I, uh, and I was at that moment at the, in the run-up area, I, was I felt like I was really suggestible. If the, if the tower controller said, hey, why don't you turn the engine off and walk back to the FBO, I would probably have been like, oh, okay. Um, but I was clear for takeoff and I just thought, all right, here's okay. what we go. <laughs> okay, here we go. Huh. And, uh, and I was feeling well at the time, but obviously cognitively I wasn't well. Um, so I went to take off and I remember uh, climbing out and I was, 100 to 200 feet, and I put the gear up, and it's electric gear in this particular one. And as I was putting the gear handle up, I had that feeling of butterflies again. It, it hit pretty hard. When you say butterflies, are you talking anxiety? Like butterflies? I've never experienced it before, um, okay. and I've never, I've never, I usually don't have any anxiety unless I'm speaking publicly. <laughs> it's like this, right? So is it very similar to how you're feeling yes. right now? right now. If you're wondering, come on in the hangar. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the lights on. It's the same thing as carbon monoxide. Well, it that'll is. be a good pitch yeah, for right. getting guests in the future. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, well, it's good. It's, it's like uh, hypoxia training, right? You can right, come here right, yes. and know what it feels like. Um, so, but I had this, it was real brief, this feeling. And the only thing, way I can explain it is like a butterfly feeling in, in my chest. And it, uh, it's similar to an anxiety feeling, I guess. I mean, that's how I described it or, or justified it earlier in the day. Um, but it only lasted about 15 seconds, and it was done, and it seemed fine. And I remember they cleared me to a left turn. Uh, they gave me a heading of 240, and I remember in the turn, um, I turned my heading bug to it and hit a heading hold on the autopilot. And then that particular autopilot only had uh, altitude hold, and then I could heading or nav or GPS steer. Um, so I had it trimmed for climb of about 105 knots in that airplane. So I was 105 knots, full rich, rich mixture, um, full power, gears up, and trim for climb. And um, I remember now the next few minutes, uh, my memory got a little fuzzy. And after I listened to live ATC, some of it came back. Um, and I had a traffic call out, and I remember calling out for that. Victor, traffic heading to your right in a mile, the helicopter eventually turning southwestbound. All right, 400 Victor is looking. And I, I kind of remember like almost a tunnel vision feeling. I remember thinking something wasn't right and I had to go back and land. And, but I continued on because I couldn't, I didn't want to change anything because everything was kind of going. I was trying to figure out what the problem was. Um, I got handed off to departure, and I missed the handoff. I called tower again, and we've done that a time or two, you know, where you don't hit flip-flop. Good evening, departure, Mooney 9149 or Victor. Climbing through 4,000. Mooney 49 Victor, you're still a tower. Departure's 125.45. And then I uh, talked to departure, and on the departure, I, I did slur my, res my response to him. Good afternoon, departure, Monday 9149 Victor, uh, climbing through 4,300, 49 Victor. 49 Victor, departure, radar contact, turn left, direct Winona, maintain 900,000. Left direct Winona up to 900,000, 49 Victor. And I, at that point, I thought, I have, to, I have to tell them I have to go back and land. I remember having my thumb above the autopod disconnect switch. Mm -hmm. um, but I still, he cleared me direct to my destination and up to 9,000 feet. I remember in the 530 going direct ONA, enter, enter. And when I get direct to clearances in that airplane, like muscle memory, I'd hit the GPS steer button. So I'd do that and then hit GPS steer. Um, and in this particular case, I remember doing that, but I didn't hit the GPS steer button. So it stayed on heading mode. It stayed on heading, yeah. Moody, Niner one, four Niner Victor, uh, Duluth. If you hear Duluth, identify, acknowledge, please. 
Hello, on X-ray, you hear Duluth okay? Loud and clear on both transmitters, helicopter 491 X-ray. November 9 or 1, 4 9 Victor. If you hear Duluth Tower or Duluth Approach, could you ident? Booty 9 or 1, 4 9 or Victor. If you hear Duluth, contact Minneapolis Center 121.05 and let them know what altitude you're climbing to. Booty 9 or 1, 4 9 or Victor. Duluth, how do you hear? And the very next thing I remember is waking up. And I thought I was flying. I started keying the mark, mic to tell ATC I dozed off. I don't know where I am, but I, I'm okay and I need to come and land. Um, and as I'm doing this, I'm just kind of staring straight ahead. And I remember thinking, man, my window looks really, really clear. This is amazing. It's just beautiful. <laughs> and, I've, and I've tried, you know, I, I live in the Mississippi River Valley, and the bugs are unbelievable there. I mean, in the early evening, you come in, it looks like you're descending into fog, and it's bugs. And so uh, I've, I would polish my window all the time, try to get it as nice as I could. And here I was proud of myself because of how good it looked. I was, this is incredible. Um, and as I'm kind of keying the mic and I'm looking out the beautiful window, uh, I sort of reached forward to just feel the window, and then I realized it wasn't there. And at that point, I, I started looking around, and there's trees off to my left, and I realized I was actually on the ground. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah, there, we're looking at pictures of it. Um, yeah, there it is. Amazing. So, okay, so you look around, and it, but it was at night, right? Yeah. Yep, it was so at night, could, so I couldn't... You could see the trees, or...? Yeah, I could see the trees a little bit to the night. There, there was no moon this night, but there was no clouds. It was a nice day to fly, that being really cold. Um, and so the stars were really brilliant. I'm out in the field in the middle of nowhere. Um, and when I first realized I was on the ground and that started to sink in, I looked off to my right, and about a mile away, I could see a searchlight in the field. Wow. And I knew right away that that was um, someone looking for me. I just assumed I was on IFR flight plan. I was talking to ATC. They would be looking for me. Um, so my next order of business was to try to get out of the airplane and to where I saw that light. Um, and I was just sitting there. I couldn't move my legs at all. I remember trying to, first I was trying to get out of the plane. I couldn't. And I tried to just wiggle my legs back and forth, and I wasn't able to. And I assumed I was paralyzed. And that didn't particularly bother me at the time. I just thought, okay, I'm paralyzed now. I have to figure out a different way to get help. Um, and at that time, I had a friend who had an accident where he came up short of a runway at night. Um, and he was able to call 911. And then the rescuers came to the airport, but they couldn't see him. And he was, able, he was pinned in the airplane. He was able to turn lights on, and they could see it. And then, mm. and then they found him. And so that was my first thought. i got to get all the lights on on this airplane. And I was reaching for the switch panel where the lights were, and I couldn't get them to work. It turned out they were kind of sunk into the panel. Um, and then I had an overhead interior light, and it was an older Mooney. It had a rotary knob to turn it on and off. And the rotary knob would only work when you turn it one direction, you know? And my hands were really cold, and I didn't have the strength or the, you know, to be able to turn it the correct way. I could turn it the wrong way, but I couldn't turn it the other way. So I wasn't able to get any lights on. Um, well, let me interrupt for a second. So. Um, I mean, you had just, you had made that call, then you, you came to with the clear sky in mm -hmm. front. How, in actual time, how long were you sitting on the ground when you woke up? Do you well, think? it's all estimated. Um, based on flight aware data, I was in the air for an hour and a half okay. after that. And then I was probably, based on when I lost flight aware until when I caught rescued, um, was about an hour and a half. So I was probably a half an hour. Half an hour. On the ground passed out. On the ground, passed out. Okay, yeah, uh, two right. hours total. All right, so you, so you tried the uh, knob and then. Yep, couldn't get that to work. Um, and then I started searching around the cockpit for other stuff. I found my phone, but it was there had an error message on it, and I was I couldn't get it to do anything. I just threw it in the back. I don't know. I should have kept it, but I didn't <laughs> think. I did find my iPad, and um, I was pretty excited about that. And I knew I was what direction I was flying when I lost consciousness, and I was just curious if I was in Minnesota or if I was in Iowa. And so I looked at it, and I found out I was in Minnesota, and then I threw that aside. Um, I could have used that to signal. So you uh, were, like, just still really impaired. I was very impaired, right? yeah. Okay. It was like uh, I, it, it was like college days, Friday night. <laughs> you know, it was stumbling around. It was, oh, wow. um, yeah, I was very impaired. Um, 
so, and while all this started happening, I don't recall when, but I noticed that there was a helicopter flying over, and it was flying in east to west and west to east, and it was getting closer and closer, and I knew they were looking for me. So I felt confident people were out looking for me, but I still felt like I needed to get out and get to help. Um, so as I was sitting there, I remembered the movies, and you know, or you always hear about if you're paralyzed, you always wiggle your toes. If you can wiggle your toes, you're okay. So I started thinking real hard about that, and I started wiggling my toes, and I thought, okay, this is good. I'm not paralyzed. Um, it turns out I was just really, really weak from uh, carbon dioxide poisoning is forced hypoxia, and so I had such little oxygen in my body, I just didn't have any energy. Um, so I went, I got my right leg out quick, fairly quickly, and then my left leg was pinned under the rudder pedals because I kind of crunched on it. And so I had to fiddle around with that for a while. And then when I finally did, I opened the door of the airplane and got on the wing, and my wife had sent along um, a pair of Carhartt bib overalls uh, in case I had a forced landing, because they're nice and warm, and she's like, you put those on and you can hike to help or whatever. So I had a Carhartt jacket in the back and then I had the Carhartt bib overalls. So I got the bib overalls out and I was trying to put them on and I, due to my injuries and my de you know, well, dexterity. You what injuries? Well, it turned out um, I had broken my upper jaw uh, knocked out some teeth. Oh my! And then uh, uh, broke three vertebrae in my back, and there was some other, you know, bruises and, and bangs. And Were things. you in immense, like immense pain or any pain? No, not at all. No, <laughs> it was none. Just I was just. Okay, so there's no pain. Yeah, there's no pain. Yeah, I was like 20 again. It didn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, is that like I can imagine if he were conscious and had this accident, and then he'd have that adrenaline rush. But you didn't. It's 30 minutes later. That. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I, well, I think the uh, lack of oxygen helps. Yeah, and that does that. Carbon monoxide is a great <laughs> anesthetic. Okay, good to know. For anyone that wants to do any, any work any on the side. Yeah, yeah um, so I didn't feel anything there. And the, I'm not a video game player, but I've seen those first person video games where they'll have a, a grenade go off or something, and they'll have everything a, a red color and that ringing, you know, and then you're. Flashbang. The flashbang. The flashbang had that ringing. It was very oh. strong ringing, so there's probably some head injury there. Um, so I, I had a loud ringing in my ears, and I was just, I wasn't 100% cognitive of what was going on, but I didn't feel any pain. Um, I did realize how cold I was, but I don't, I didn't feel it in a traditional sense. I think I felt it because I was numb at that point. Um, so I get out of the airplane, and I get the bib overalls out, and I lay down on the wing, and I'm trying to put them on, and I, I fiddled around with that for a while, and that wasn't working. So I grabbed my car jacket and put it on. I couldn't zip it up. I didn't have the dexterity in my hands um, at that point. So then I went back in the plane and tried to find my hat, my gloves, and my flashlight, and everything that I had organized, and everything was gone. Um, Imagine that. Yeah, it, the airplane will rearrange itself. Yeah. Really, and s certain things weren't even found after the airplane was recovered. So I mean, it, it, it was pretty violent. Um, so then I decided, to, I just had my car jacket on, I couldn't zip it up, and I thought I'm gonna set off towards that light. At this time, I hadn't looked around at the surroundings at all. I just was focused on where that light was. Um, I took about three steps and fell down, and then I got up and took a few more steps and fell down, and I would, I would only be able to go three or four steps, and I'd fall. Sometimes I'd fall backwards, and I remember swearing because it wasn't netting me the direction I was trying to go, and I'm like, I gotta do that over. I was really mad. Um, Did you try yelling to the light? I, I didn't, it was so far away, and I hadn't seen oh, okay. it, after I got out of the airplane, I hadn't seen it again. I just oh, saw okay. it when I was pinned. So you were just heading that direction? Yeah, heading that direction. It turned out I was just walking towards the middle of a field, um, and it was sort of downhill, so if you remember when you're 20 in college, you kind of go path least resistance. <laughs> and I was sort of stumbling downhill, and I, I made it about 75 to 100 yards from the airplane. And then I, I fell down and I rolled over and the helicopter was coming back and it was going right over the top of me and I, I yelled and did everything and they just kept trucking and I realized that if they didn't see me, they're not gonna. They flew over the airplane and over myself and they didn't see me. Um, I was getting really comfortable at this point. I was tired and uh, I just kind of settled in and I laid down and I felt really, really comfortable. I started getting warm and uh, I'm like, you know what, if they find me, Great. If they don't, I don't really care either. I'm just staying right here. And what was, this is the neat part of the story. Um, three years prior, um, February 7th, uh, three years in 2014, my wife was pregnant, and we—I uh, was loaning her into the, the truck to take her to the airport or the airport 
I'm a pilot, right? <laughs> Take her to the hospital. <laughs> Take her to the hospital to have a, our baby, our second, our second baby. And we knew it was a girl. But Remember, we you don't have a carbon monoxide now. No. <laughs> well, sometimes there's long-term effects. Yeah, That's what okay. I tell my wife, right? Um, so uh, I'm loading her in to go to the hospital um, to have our baby girl. And we, didn't, we hadn't named her yet, but we knew it was a girl. And I'm loading her into the van or the truck. And she, my wife said, we don't have a name for her yet. You know? And I looked up. And um, one of the names we're kicking around was Maya, and it was after the star in the Pleiades star cluster, um, which is always prevalent in the night sky. And I remember looking up at the car, you know, pushing her into the car, like, we got to go, and seeing that, I said, hey, we can name her Maya. And so that's what we ended up naming her. And as I'm laying there in the field, all comfortable, I'm staring right at Pleiades, and that moment of, of putting my wife in the car flashed into my memory. And up until that point, I hadn't thought about who I was or who I, if, if I had a family. I hadn't thought about any of that stuff. Um, and that just flashed me into my life and gave me the strength to wow. just try to go get help. And the, it, was a, it was a really refreshing experience because it was the first, I thought to myself, if I, if I get up and this hurts, because it hurt walking, I think. I said I didn't feel pain, but I mean, I remember I didn't want to go anymore. Um, if it, if it hurt trying to get to help and I didn't make it, I mean, the end result's the same as me laying here, so it doesn't, it's not really a sacrifice. So I have to try to get to help. And uh, that, that was really refreshing because it was the first time in my adult life that I only had one thing to do. I didn't have to worry about anything. I didn't have to worry about paying bills or being someplace on time or anything. I just had one thing to do. Um, and that was, that was a blessing in the whole accident because it was part of the experience that I, I'm fond of and I, I kind of look back on. But I, I uh, then sat up and kind of looked around. It was the first time I reassessed my surroundings. I looked back at the airplane. And um, I hate to admit this, but part of me, and it's because I was impaired, I looked at the airplane and I was like, yeah, I crashed that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, but anyway, so I, I noticed that the- 20 year old, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? And so I noticed uh, the other side of the airplane, there was woods and trees, and, and beyond the woods and trees, there was a service light and some outbuildings. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that was the closest thing to me. And so I thought I'd have to go there. And I, and I didn't know if it was outbuildings from a farm and there wasn't gonna be a farmhouse, I didn't know what it was, but I was hoping that someone would be there. So I walked back towards the airplane, and then uh, as time progressed, I was able to have more energy and more strength, and I was able to walk further. So I did fall a little bit and crawl going back to the airplane, but it was better than the trip out. And then uh, I got back to the airplane, and I remember walking up to the horizontal stabilizer and giving it a tap and, and thanking it, because I, I understood the gravity of the situation at that yeah. time. Uh, and then I set off to the woods, and I, I got up to the edge of the woods, and. It, there was all this um, brush and you know, kind of this gnarly undergrowth. And I was standing there and I remember thinking to myself, if I was healthy, I would walk around this. I said, but I want to go there and it's in the way, I'm going straight, I don't care. So I go into this brush and I get stuck and I'm all tangled up and I'm fighting it and I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized I was pressed up against a barbed wire fence. Oh, but fortunately I had a carhartt jacket on and that's like okay. armor. Um, so I dropped down, I crawled under the fence, and then once I was in the woods, it was, it was good because there was trees, so I could sort of balance myself. But then it was also bad because there was um, about a foot of snow. Uh, in the field, the snow was windswept and there wasn't much snow. And so as I'm falling, I started to, my hands got like bricks. I couldn't move my fingers, and I'm kind of crawling through it. And I, I was very upset that I might live, and then my hands were gonna be mm -hmm. gone. Uh, that really bothered me. Um, so I made it up through the woods and I got up next to this outbuilding and kind of shimmied along it. And then I turned and I could see a house and there was a, a blue flicker of a TV in the window and it was just the greatest sight I've ever seen. Uh, I made it over there and pounded on the window and kind of was yelling, help me. And this great, uh, this great woman, her name is Cynthia Crabtree. This was her house and her husband was, he's retired, but he drives school bus for the girls, you know, uh, sports teams. So he wasn't home, it was just her, she's out in the country, and this guy with a bloody face is pounding on our window. <laughs> and she was great, she, uh, she, her story was she invited me in through her garage. My story, my memory was I like, pushed my way in, but I, uh, I would just wanted warmth at that time. And I came in and sat down at, the, at her table and told her to call 911. And she did, but she was kind of panicky, I found out later, and she was calling 911111111 <laughs> uh, and wasn't working. 
um, and it turns out her son was a state patrol, and she called him, and he goes, We've, we're looking for a guy, like, we're right there. And so then she, he, he got the authorities coming, and uh, they were there, there was a deputy there within two minutes. I mean, he was wow. right in the area looking. And uh, then I had her call my wife, and I remembered her phone number, believe it or not. And uh, wow, my amazing. wife didn't quite understand what it, why some woman from Ellendale, Minnesota was calling her. Oh, my. Um, and then the, the helicopter that was flying over turned out to be a medevac. Oh. And it, I don't know the whole story, but it was either airborne uh, when I was, or the ATC said, hey, we got an airplane down. And they volunteered to come look. But of course, they didn't have, they didn't have night vision or... Um, I had a 121.5 ELT. They could hear it, but they couldn't track it. Right. Um, and uh, but they they were able to land, and within a minute, so I was in a helicopter and heading to the Mayo Clinic. Okay. So going back to when you walked by your plane and you tapped the stabilizer, mm -hmm. um, at that point you're starting to get a little bit more clarity. Did you think I must have had carbon monoxide, or were no. you just like I? I don't know why. You think maybe you just went to fell asleep? Oops, bad me. Um, I didn't think that deep. Uh, I didn't think about why it happened at all. Um, and so that was interesting. Huh. I got airlifted to the Mayo Clinic and did a fantastic job in ICU. But they were really concerned with why I passed out. And it was apparently it is a protocol when a pilot comes in that they just test for carbon monoxide. Um, and they at this time they had me on oxygen and I was really talk, talkative. I was talking to the nurses. Where are you from? I was just <laughs> it was crazy. Hey, I was in a plane crash, you know. And um, well, coincidentally, when you go to ICU from a plane crash, you get really good treatment. You're you're, you're like a, you're a rock star. It's yeah. amazing. You're like that's the guy. Um, so so that was good. But I I remember uh, one of the doctors. Um, I had been there for a while. I think they might have already sewed my I had lacerations on my face. I think they fixed that up. And uh, I remember coming up to me and she said, we need to know why you passed out. And I think at this time they did a CT scan, they did a EKG. They were trying to figure out if I had a heart attack. They had no idea. Um, and all that stuff wasn't showing anything. And, and she said, we have to know why. What did you do? What, what's wrong with you? You know, you 39 year olds just don't pass out. And I said, I have no idea. And she was walking away and then it occurred to me, I said, carbon monoxide, did you guys check for that? And uh, she said no, and they came and drew blood, and off they went. And 10 minutes later, she came back with like a smile on her face, and she's just like, yeah, that's what it was. So my, my uh, carboxy hemoglobin level, which was 13.9%, typical, you're gonna be zero to 1%, smokers will be 10, but it has a half-life of five hours. So this, at this point, we're already five hours out from the crash, mm -hmm. so I would have been double that. Wow. Um, plus, uh, I was breathing pure oxygen a lot of that time, so it even it shortens the half life. So I was probably the NTSB figured around thirty percent. Oh my goodness! Yeah. So what were so I want to know kind of the immediate after effect of it. So did you have any immediate prolonged health issues? What about the NTSB or the FAA? Like, uh, there's just so much to. Know yeah. There. Well, the no prolonged health issues that we know of, right? And there might be cognitive ones. I probably was a lot better looking, and, and, uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure that was, I was a lot better looking before. Um, but uh, fortunately, I went to the Mayo Clinic, and a uh, doctor in the, in the uh, ICU there recognized that I had carbon monoxide, and it was important to get me hyperbaric treatments. So I was in the hyperbaric chamber at Mayo within 12 hours of the crash, and. I did three treatments of that. Each treatment was about three to four hours long. And that had two great effects. They've, there's some studies that show that it, it helps with the long-term effects of carbon monoxide. Um, and so I haven't had any other recurring symptoms that they, they look for. Uh, and the side effect benefit was I had frostbite so bad in my hands. All the doctors were telling me I would never have feeling in my fingers again. Um, but I believe I, I'm probably back to about 80 or 90% and it's good enough now, it's, wow. it's fine. And, and how long ago was this accident? Uh, three years. Three years. February 2017. Okay. And, uh, but I, I attribute the healing of, the, of all the frostbite with the hyperbaric treatment, Wow. I, I think. So it's been a, a bit of a miracle. The FA and the NTSB um, have been nothing but great. Um, the NTSB investigator I dealt with was fantastic. Um, did I say NTSB? You did? Okay, I met both NTSB and FA were great. Yeah. Uh, the NTSB investigator I actually became friends with. Um, she's since retired, but uh, she was great. When I was talking with her early on, she asked if I'd be willing to work with them on safety products because she said it's always best when we have a victim 
to promote things, and she goes, carbon monoxide never leaves victims. So this is, this is a big deal. And I figured it was the least I could do. There was a similar story that happened in 20, 1997 um, a guy in a Comanche 400 in Missouri, same thing. He, he just went to sleep and he woke up in a field. And he did a little bit of advocacy, but um, I feel like we need to remind people and, you know, to prevent people like so myself to do this again. Yeah. Oh, wow. And there's about one, it's on average, it's about one fatality a year from carbon monoxide. Wow. So it's not a big, big problem, but it's something we can fix. Um, so can you fly today? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, I bought a, uh, another Mooney uh, about six months later, five months later. Okay. Did they find out where the carbon monoxide came mm -hmm. from? Yes, it was a it was a traditional classic crack in the exhaust uh, in the heat exchanger, and um, there was about seven hundred hours on the exhaust. The exhaust was about seven years old, I think, if I remember right. Um, and the flight before this day of flights, a series of flights, I took my wife and kids out for ice cream. And when we were, there's an airport that always, it's weird to have ice cream in January in Minnesota, right. but we flew, we flew down to get ice cream. And uh, when I was starting up to come home, there was a backfire and it startled my wife and she, and I had to calm her down. It was just a backfire, it's not a big deal. Well, in reality, that, that airplane had never backfired on me since I'd owned it. So maybe that's when the crack happened? It either, it either exacerbated it or it caused it. Okay. Did you not have a CO detector in I your did not. No. You did not. did not. Okay. So, I, I, uh, this I bet is that's I, a takeaway. Yeah, that's obviously a takeaway. Um, and I've done a lot of research since about, about CO and, and the, right. all the other crashes. And um, there's a lot of things I did wrong on this flight. Um, one is the carbon monoxide detector. And I, 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 the blame is all on myself, but I think that the way it's been taught to us, carbon monoxide in, in all the aviation. Um, syllabuses and things, the way the FAA teaches it, is a little misguided because they'll give us numbers about our car carboxyhemoglobin percentage and what it means. Well, that doesn't mean anything to a pilot because we're not going and getting tested. Um, they also give us, uh, they give us symptoms, but the way they read the symptoms, it really feels like it's going to be a linear scale. And when you start to get it, you're going to start to get a slight headache. That head's going to get worse. You're going to start feeling nausea. I always assumed it was going to be this linear scale where I just started feeling worse and worse and worse. And I also assumed that it was only going to happen in winter with the heater on. And so I thought as a good pilot, I would, uh, I would be able to catch it because I'd say, well, the heater's on, I got a headache, this makes sense. The problem is by the time you're experiencing symptoms, your cognitive ability has been compromised enough that it's harder to make. It's just like hypoxia, it's a forced hypoxia. Yeah. So. Okay, so what do you recommend for pilots? First, a digital CO detector. Yeah. Um, Get rid of the stupid tab. Those tabs are yeah. terrible. I mean, you're, you both are CFIs, right? Yeah. When, when, when I bought my plane, um, uh, the guy who used to own it, like two owners before, that was the first thing he said, what do you got a tab in there? Get rid of the tabs. Yeah. And it, yeah. You both are CFIs. As a CFI, there's been so many times I've been doing a flight review for someone and you get in and uh, it's 2017 and the tab says expired in 2004. Like, what, <laughs> why is that up there, you know? Um, and so, and the NTSB sort of joked with me too. They're like, oh, the tabs are great. We know why you crashed. You know, <laughs> we know why you died. They can look at it. Um, so those, those are terrible. They're, they're terrible for one thing. They have a short shelf life and it's hard to recognize them. In a night cockpit, it would be difficult. You have to have the cognitive ability to see it and take action. Yeah. And that's difficult. Um, and there's cleaners and things that we use in the cockpit that can mess it up. Mess it up. Uh, so the, the, the only thing is, is a digital detector. Uh, there's lots of different ones on the market now. Technology has got it in the last few years that there's tons of them. They're inexpensive. So preventing carbon monoxide should be like, prevent, you shouldn't run out of gas. You shouldn't have carbon monoxide pumps. Uh, like I said, there's great products coming out. The Sentry ADSB box has a carbon monoxide detector in it. Oh, wow. There's um, all sorts of products on the way that are coming out. And I advise it's good to have two of them um, because if, if one isn't working and you don't know it's not working, that might be a, a false sense too. And they're so cheap. I have three, four actually, if you. <laughs> yeah, got a, pa yeah. a panel mount and uh, a couple you more. I mean, I'm gonna go get another one. I'm on my second uh, digital. Backup for backup. Yeah, 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 especially after hearing this. Well, Dan, I wanna thank you so much for can coming. I, yeah, please. Can I just do, okay, sorry. The other big takeaway is how to, what to do with surviving a crash. 
Oh, um, yeah. I'm, another thing you see people talk about is well, they always talk about their survival kit, what I have for my crash kit. Well, we live, for people in Alaska, that's a different story, but most of us in Texas and, and Midwest and, and just in the continental United States almost, um, we don't need a hatchet and paracord and tents and you know, fire starters and all this. You need a reliable way to get a hold of people to, for communication. Um, so a cell phone, Obviously, is a good one. Um, a handheld radio. I always, I had a handheld radio. I didn't have it with me. I always assumed the handheld. I had a handheld radio for when I have a, a comm failure. But in reality, the handheld radio is so when you're on the ground injured, you can dial up 121.5 and talk to the helicopter that's flying overhead. Right. Or whatever. It's not really for a comm failure. Um, I didn't have it with me because I had good avionics and it was working well, and I just didn't bring it. Um, uh, and a PLB is a great thing to have. Years before, I had a PLB that had a strobe on it, and it occurred to me even during all this while I was impaired, oh, if I still had that, um, I'd have a 406 megahertz ELT in my hand, and I'd have a strobe for the helicopter. Um, and when you crash an airplane, things get rearranged so much, and there's a good chance you're gonna be pinned or injured, and you won't be able to get out of the plane. You really need everything within reach, fixed to the airframe or yourself. Um, so I'm wearing this very attractive vest, right? I don't normally wear vests. Um, this is a flight vest for me. Okay. I use it. I don't have anything in it now, but I'll keep all the necessary things I need, all the way down to a, uh, uh, one of those, those whistles. So if someone's out tramping through the woods looking for me, I can at least blow a whistle. So stock yourself with communication devices. Keep them on you or fix the airframe. You know, my handheld radio now is always charged and bolted next to me. Um, so that, that was a really big takeaway for me. Wow. Well, there's a lot to take away on yeah. this. So it was an incredible um, story. Yeah. So thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you so much for yep. being on the show. Yep. Thanks. Well, and hopefully there's a lot for you to take away. Um, please get rid of the tabs. If you've got them in your cockpit, get a digital uh, CO detector and be safe out there. Um, I love the idea of always having your personal handheld radio, uh, the, attaching it to yourself or to the plane. That's a really good one, too. So we want you guys to be safe, and, and thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. We'll see you next time in the hangar.